Uh, hello, Nick. Welcome to the program, first of all. Thank you. We're obviously talking about um, Sir John, uh, Reverend John Hugh Smith Pigott. Uh, you've been, you know, probing into the history and life and the building, of course, where he lived and where he had that abode of love, as they called it. So I understand that the first and the primary motive of probing into that must have been history because you are an historian. But why particularly Pigott? I think when you're looking at the history of a house, you get a sense of the character of the house by looking at the people who lived there. And in many ways, because it had been converted from a form of stable block around about the 1910s, 1915, there's a huge amount of his personality that's infused into the bricks and mortar. When you walk in the place, you feel as though you are entering almost like a religious space. And that's partly the force of his personality, I think. So you have to get a sense of the characters who lived in a house, as well as the bricks and mortar, the documents, the archive material. Otherwise, it's out of context. So in many ways, there's a motive for building a house in a certain way. So you need to understand the person behind it. So what did you see when you went in search of that person? What type of a person did you find? He certainly had a vision of what he wanted. He had a very clear, defined view of his world, of what he thought was going to be in place. Some of that is reflected in the house and the architecture. Very bold, very striking designs. As I said, almost like a religious space. There's this chapel-like feel to the front reception rooms, as though you're entering into his personal space, which is very devout, very religious. So you can certainly pick that up from the actual style of the architecture. But when you start looking at the individual himself, well, it's like various layers. You're starting to understand the person, but also the beliefs behind that person. You can start to see almost the way his thoughts change over time when you look at how he uh, moves through career, through his religious beliefs, the various stages of his devotion, and how his ideas begin to embrace those around him as well. Mm -hmm. So when you've studied all that about his personality and his beliefs and his claims, how has it sort of unfolded? He starts off by making some very bold statements, which from an outsider's perspective would be effectively labelling him as an eccentric almost, I'd imagine, because he claims to be God. So he's making some very bold claims. And a lot of people would, you know, obviously looked at him and said, well, you know, who are you to be making these sort of statements? And it upset people. It was quite controversial. He didn't mind. He seemed to be very single-minded, very devout in his beliefs and of course because he was so strong-minded that level of confidence attracted other people to him as well hence the whole idea of building up what people have called a cult because his strength of personality his devout belief uh, infused other people to believe in a similar sort of belief system yes but then later on when you study in the like the later part of his life he seems to have given up the claim of being god and just sticking to the claim of being you know, a religious figure and a messiah. He certainly seems to modify the way he looks at the world. Now, whether that's because of his experiences in the house or through life or the experience of actually becoming the head of what people were describing as a cult might well have changed his outlook. And this is quite often the way that I've found researching not just him but other historical figures. You get to that level of single-minded focus and devoutness and then suddenly there seems to be an embracing of the wider world of how that philosophy fits in. And then sometimes the claims are what you would call downgraded. So he does change from claiming to be God himself to a messiah, a leader figure. And in many ways that, I think, starts to reflect his personality and the fact that he is a little bit more malleable to other people's ideas, perhaps. The sense that he has a responsibility to those who are following him that perhaps can be broadened out. So you do get a sense of a change of belief, not necessarily in the strength of belief, but in the way that manifests, it manifests itself in the terminology that he uses. Yeah, great. And uh, would you like to tell us about the way he was buried? And that obviously carries a story with it as well. So if you... He had very strong beliefs about his role in the world and also about the resurrection. And he translated this into his final wishes in his last will and testament and very specific instructions as to how he wished to be buried. And unlike most people who are buried six feet down horizontally, he wanted to be buried vertically, standing upright, ready for the resurrection, which I think must have raised quite a few eyebrows. I certainly did a double take when I looked at that. And many years later, after he died in 1927, they actually had a look to see whether or not a resurrection had taken place. And it did seem to go against quite a lot of what he believed. So there was no sign of any miraculous change in his status. So he certainly believed right to the end that everything that he'd taught up to that point was true. And he prepared for the resurrection by the way he was buried vertically. Yes. 
Thank you very much, Nick. Wonderful. That's Thank you. Wonderful.